And so, so he was a PGA coach with 20 plus years of coaching experience, working with some of the best European tour players. Uh, so he has a, on, on top of that, he's working with developing young and up and coming coaches as well. So I think he can share a lot of great insights uh, with us here today. Hugh, how are you doing? Yeah, good, man. Nice to see you. Likewise, likewise. It's great for you to have be able to join. Uh, I love that you're participating <laughs> in the webinar as well. Uh, I, had, so yeah, I, had, I, I had to give Dan us. a hard time. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> he gave a shout out to you as well. So you're, you, <laughs> must, you must be both close, right? So Yeah, he's a good guy. Uh, good man. Yeah, but... I, Obviously, of course, yeah, thank you for joining. And I think kind of uh, I'll mention a bit kind of what's going to be the format um, for you here today. Uh, we're going to keep it a bit more conversation-like. Uh, there's tons of questions I would love to cover with you uh, because I think the stuff that you, the thing that you're doing on your day-to-day -day basis is very topical, very, uh, could be very relatable to a lot of golf coaches and players. So I think uh, it'd be great just to get your perspective. And obviously we encourage everyone to ask questions in the Q&A and we'll try to get everything covered as much as we can. Uh, maybe I can ask you a first question to kick it off. Can you kind of maybe in your words, explain a bit more your background and experience as a golf coach? Uh, kind of how do you get started and how would you characterize yourself today in the golf industry? Good question. Um... Basically, I got started because I was frustrated with what was out there. That was the kind of my primary driver, a little bit like Dan, in that I never felt that sort of golf coaching or anything that was written in, in books or magazines or videos at the time was, was enough for me. It didn't feel like it was anything substantial enough, and it didn't feel like there was any kind of real objective element to it. And I, I'm, I've got a fairly black and white brain. I'm I've always historically been pretty good at picking my way through problems and joining dots. And I wanted fact, I wanted to be dealing in something really significant, substantial that we could measure. And that knowing that if, if, if we impacted that element of that, that player's game, it would have a, an impact on their score. So I, I was driven very early as a coach to spend time looking for um, looking, looking for data. Basically, I became a bit of a, a data geek early on. And even in my own game, when I was a very novice golfer, I was keeping stats. And that kind of drove me down the path later on in my career where I, I guess I was a little bit of a pioneer when it came to, when it came to using data, stats, sports science. I've always been fascinated by sports science and, and getting to understand how human beings function. And that kind of led me to my relationships with you guys, with TrackMan, um, with, with a number of like Mark Bull, who, who, who Dan gave a shout out to earlier. Uh, these guys were, were all kind of, I guess I, f I fell upon them in my quest to find more information and more, and more facts than, um, than the majority. And then basically my coaching systems grew as a product of that. Yeah. And... And how many tour players are you working with currently? Because obviously, I think the number I saw online was eight, right? But it's kind of ongoing, I would assume, with a lot of players, right? Yeah, it's uh, it's three just now, basically because I, I made the decision a year ago to stop traveling on tour on a full-time basis because I wanted to commit my time to coach education, to mentoring the next generation of coaches, and and really, I guess, to to feel like I'm helping the, in, the, the golf coaching industry serve the game of golf better. And mm -hmm. so it's... I still work with uh, with three sort of three four guys. I do the majority of the work back home. I'll go to the occasional event, but uh, my focus has definitely shifted now much more towards the coach education uh, element of, of of the business. Yeah, and obviously, like we would be curious to know your perspective uh, regarding hack motion. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, kind of the, the relationship started a couple of years ago. How would you characterize what's the role of hack motion in your teaching when you're working with a player? Where do you see the product being used the most and where do you see the most benefit for it for your coaching? So effectively, my, my coaching process is very similar to Dan's and that, uh, that I have to start at by what I call analyzing the <clears throat> what the player is doing as of now. 
And for me, that analysis is most effective if it is a objective measured analysis. So clearly tools like TrackMan and HackMotion come into that process and Swing Catalyst is something I've, I've started using in, re in recent months. Clearly that's part of the analysis process. So I'm very clear that I want to know what is happening and how that relates to the golfer's ability to either strike it or flight it. Then I'll use the information I've got. Uh, and as I said, whether that's hack motion track man, whether it's working with Mark Bull in the 3D perspective, once I've got that information, it then leads me to make a educated diagnosis. So we've got the what, then we look at the why, and any technology helps me come to a better, as I said, more educated conclusion on the why. So what do I need to shift in this player's movement or behavior to get the desired impact I'm looking for? And then the great thing about, about a lot of the technology now is that it can also contribute to the coaching process and the learning process for the players. I've said many times before that I think one of the great benefits of Hack is the audible feedback feature. Because that for me is it almost... I'm not trying to undersell what we do as coaches, but it almost puts me in a position where I don't need to physically coach someone. I'm asking them to solve the problem themselves, which from a learning perspective is much more powerful. Being instructed versus rather than learning from within, you've got a much better chance of it, of it sticking if the player has identified the, if you like, the fix or the, or the, the change from within. Uh, and it also gives me the luxury of being able to monitor progress. Is the player doing something different, not different? Have they overdone it? And highlight to the player, look, this is where we're at and you're making great progress with it. Or we need to find another way to get the same, the same response. Yeah. One thing I would be curious to ask with regards to that analysis process that you mentioned about being the kind of data focused, mm -hmm. uh, do you see some challenges when players are going through that kind of process uh, without coaches supervision, when they're using technology products on their own and maybe there's some suggestions what they should, should try to do to kind of don't go to, down the wrong path, if you will, right? Because every product's kind of emphasizing this, its own own aspects of it. Uh, is there some 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 uh, suggestions you would have for players if they're doing it without a coach on their own? Yeah, I've got a uh, well, I've got a number of answers here. Frank, the dog is contributing now. Um, I've got a number of answers here. Number one, it's not just players. Coaches are guilty of the same thing. And a lot of that is driven by our thirst for knowledge, particularly in this generation where anything is accessible at the click of a switch. The thirst for knowledge rather than a thirst for understanding. So I, I've said for many years that I do not believe that data collecting is coaching. Data collecting may be something that you base your coaching on. It helps you make that educated decision that I talk about, but data collection isn't coaching. And to truly impact your players, you need to thoroughly understand what the data is telling you, number one. And number two, you need to have the coaching tools to be able to put that effectively in the hands of the players. That's great coaching. And technology should not be confused for coaching. It's part of the process. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the use of hack motion in your experience, have you had, maybe there's a highlight from an example working with your players where you've seen that kind of the the wrist pattern or wrist motion improvements have kind of paid the biggest dividends. And, and if you, maybe you can talk a bit more, what was the specific issue and what, what was that kind of solution to the problem that you had? Well, let's, let me go back a couple of steps. And I think that, again, this is, this is where we have to be careful of our use of technology as an industry in that in my experience, the majority of issues I see through wrists is driven by movement dysfunction somewhere else. This just happens to be the last bit of the chain that's most obvious. So just trying to fix risk conditions in itself is potentially dangerous. You've got to understand why the wrists are behaving the way they are. So in my, in my use of hack, the first thing I'm going to do is, as I think Dan does, is I'm going to get it on the player and get some information. Let me make a, 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 a qualified analysis so I can make a qualified diagnosis. I'll quite often use with players if we've identified, so Lucas Beregard's a player I'm going to use as an example, and he was using hack on a regular basis when he was, when he was top 50 in the world. Um, we parted ways for 
I guess, yeah, God, we parted ways for three years. We've recently started working together. So, and that, and that was the reason I asked the question of Dan, that, that, is it worthwhile going back the way? Because I'm actually experiencing with, with this particular player that going back the way may not be handy because mm -hmm. he's got a whole load of water under the bridge. My skills have hopefully evolved over the course of three years. But with Lucas, it was very much the way his, the way his, his trail arm functioned led him to get into extension at the top of the backswing. And then when he was particularly poor, that extension would increase in transition. That was basically his, his bad swing habit. When he was at his very best, he was still in that shape at the top of the backswing, marginally less because the, the trail arm had worked better. But the big difference was that he was able to effectively retain this for longer in transition instead of seeing this which when the player is trying to hit a kind of compressed fade is a pretty damaging way to start the journey to a compressed fade. Um, it, we were able to use it to monitor actually how good the trail arm work was and how different it was when he hit P6 in the right way versus the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And what was, and, and how, how was the kind of the practical side of that exercise for you? Was it just kind of doing repetitions and trying to, replicate the pattern that you want him to follow yeah was there was something else when it comes to kind of that process of how do you went through it of making well, those the, adjustments to, to to rewind to the start of our relationship he, uh, we started working together in 2017 and his game wasn't in great shape he he's a high speed player big strong guy proper unit uh, and he could hit it anywhere that's always be his, his issue has never been finding the middle is his issue has been making sure the, the middle is aimed roughly where he wants it to end up. And it was, it was a difficult time of season to start working with him because he basically needed to play well for two months to keep his card. That was, so I'm, I'm under pressure and have to find a way to get him to improve quickly. Uh, I use in terms of how the unit was used at that time, it was very much a case of saying, right, let's just, you keep the noise on and make sure you fold your right shoulder. So basically I would have right shoulder, right arm working better. His job is to get feedback by keeping tack motion on. The big thing that I think we achieved in that relationship early was I didn't allow him to hit one shot in practice, regardless of how much he's working on his golf swing without trying to produce a fade. So his feels were always attached to a very specific outcome. He wants to fade the ball. He's a better player when he fades it. And every single shot we hit, literally, I guess for about six months, was attached to him hitting a fade. It wasn't good enough for him to do a good job here and forget about everything else. He had to do a good job here and produce the ball flight that he was looking for, which made his practice quite exhausting. Neurologically, that was quite a challenge for him. Um, but he got into the habit of just knowing that every time he made a golf swing, he was going to hit a fade. The intellectual and emotional impact of that, I think was pretty significant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so essentially kind of, you, you, you made it kind of very dense in a way, like you kind of really kind of made a whole big change and you kind of really dialed it in and really focused on it throughout yeah. the, throughout the that wasn't, uh, neither of us were in that, that luxurious position where we could take some time to get worse before we get better, which is a principle that I despise in golf coaching, but, he had to hit better shots now. And I didn't care whether it was a 15 yard fade with a five iron. I just, we needed something that he knew was predictable and he knew the feels associated with that particular shape. Yeah. And were there any other adjustments in the swing that you made besides the, the wrist pattern changes that you did uh, that was trying to emphasize or that was the primary one? Just little bits. Um, it, it very much, I mean, a little bit like Dan. I'm a massive believer that a player has to be, has to adopt an appropriate start position for what they're trying to do, not just from an impact geometry perspective, but also from a movement perspective. So we, we tweaked a couple of things at setup, tweaked his shaft lean at setup, we, we tweaked his stance width at setup, both of which I thought were contributing. Um, but really that was, it was always get set up to it well and move in this way and produce me a fade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you're as a coach uh, going through this diagnosis, diagnosis process with your players what are kind of the key technologies that you tend to use besides hack motion in that process uh, uh hack, what's hack your motion kind of your staples in that process uh camera hack motion 3d track man uh, i will look at 
basically I use Swing Catalyst just to gather data. So I've got a reference point. Mm. Um, that's, that's it. And I'm, I'm not one of these guys that has to have the latest technology. Uh, I, I'm a real believer that for you to be an expert coach, you have to be a, a real expert in the technology you use. So again, it's not the technology that's the coaching gold. It's how you choose to use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when it comes to hack motion use, while, I'll, while we're staying on the topic, have you ever had a case example where you're working specifically on improvements in the wage gain? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I specialize to an extent in short game and wedge game. Um, and it's, again, it's very, I find hack very good for helping players understand the feel of the different release patterns for different shots. Mm -hmm. So, and what will be the and kind of what will be the release pattern that you try to emphasize for the players uh, when it comes to the short game specifically? I wouldn't say there was one. I would say that I was striving for consistency for that player. Mm -hmm. So, however they chose to deliver the club, if if they have a movement that that isn't necessarily isn't producing consistent results, I'd want to identify. Okay, well, let's let's find out what does produce consistent results, and then give them some parameters to work with and give them some tolerances to work with them. Mm -hmm. Because obviously yeah. the, the challenge of short game is that literally every single shot is different. Every lie is different. It requires different combination of speed, spin, and trajectory. So identifying a pattern or a stock pattern is very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I use it much, much more to, to effectively identify the DNA, the release DNA for that player, and then make sure that we keep it within manageable parameters. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'd be curious to ask you as well, right? Because I think this is all sounds like uh, a process, obviously, right? You go through with the player, understand what he does, what the goals are and everything. Uh, but I was very surprised that I hear you talk about a, a stat that only very small fraction of people actually take golf coaching. Uh, like mm. a lot of people play golf without actually ever getting coaching. Would there be any suggestions how to go through this process for amateur players that are not taking coaching? And obviously, first, would be go get coaching, right? But are there maybe some other like suggestions or advice that you would give players as they're going through this kind of process? I mean, it's hard. I think you, I mean, you've hit the nail on the head. We need to do more to get people taking coaching in the first place. Um, I, I don't think we're particularly good at, at number one, getting people through the door and then number two, keeping them coming through the door. Mm -hmm. But my process for a club player is not dissimilar to a process for a tour player. I'm running analysis, diagnosis, coach, and review in every single session. My job is to make that player better on their terms right now. That's it. That's all I've got to do. And it's got to look very different for every single player because we're all fundamentally different, but I need a robust system that ensures that I get it right on their terms. That makes sense? Yeah, and no, obviously it does, right? Because everyone has their own swing tendencies, nuances, and the stuff that you can and can't do. And I think kind of what you're ultimately looking for is consistency in the swing. And which you're, so you want a kind of predictable outcome as much as possible. Uh, I think I think it, it needs consistency in key components in the swing. And those key components yeah. may be very different. I mean, I suspect just listening to Dan talk about Simon Dyson, that, that Dyson's key components are going to be very different to Lucas Beregaard's. But yeah. our job as a coach is not to, to insist that they have everything in line. It's ensuring, number one, that all of their key components are in line because they have to be able to play golf. And it doesn't, it's actually more important for a 15 handicap who plays in the weekend because they're, that, that's their passion. We're, we're responsible mm -hmm. for, for making them enjoy what they love doing more and more. And you don't have the luxury of three, four, five hours on a range with a, 15 handicapper when that, that you do with a tour pro mm -hmm. yeah that'd be curious to ask because uh, dan said you'd be a good person to answer this uh you said that your process is kind of fairly consistent when it comes to amateur players and the tour players kind of the general process is more or less the same but are there any kind of nuances that you have to take into account obviously one is the the sheer skill level and then kind of the ability maybe the process the technical concepts and maybe also the time like how much they're able to devote, but are there some aspects around working with the typical club player versus a pro uh, that you have to take into account when you're approaching that particular player? No, because I think you're taking all of that into account regardless of where they're playing their golf and how good they are. That mm -hmm. I'm a firm believer that 
giving a Saturday morning lesson to Joe the plumber is very similar to giving a Wednesday afternoon lesson to Torbjorn Olison on the range at a major. Mm -hmm. I need to be able to provide that player with the least invasive advice that makes them hit better shots now. Because Joe the plumber, I want Joe the plumber to go and enjoy his weekend. And I want Torbjorn Olison to win me lots of money. So it, it, the, the challenge isn't any different. And I, I think it's, I don't know why this is the case, but what, what we refer to as quick tip coaching in golf has got a really bad rap. I think the, the terminology is wrong, but the reality is that tour coaching, to my mind, is quick tip coaching around a plan. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't feel much different to Joe the Plumber. We've all got an idea of where we want his golf swing in six months or a year's time. It's no, that's no different to Torbjorn. What's the difference? Time, talent. Do they respond to how they respond, how, how best they learn? Are they, are they drill people? Are they training aid people? Are they, it, it, I don't think that the process is any different. And in terms of my system, it's my system. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit of an asshole here, but my system is exactly the same every time because that is what leads me to make the right judgment call based on time, talent, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess the, the, the approach and kind of the objective of kind of getting the result quick, not quick, but efficiently mm. and, 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 and uh, relatively quickly is kind of the, the compass that you're using. No, I, can, I think quick. I really do. Because okay. impact's binary. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know how many people you, you've, you've got on the webinar today, but I, uh, I'm pretty sure if I give them all the same pieces of the same piece of data, they can tell me exactly what that golf ball did. Zero swing direction, four and a half down with a seven iron, launched at half the loft, face just inside of the path, out the middle of the club. It's being swung at 95 miles an hour. Pretty much everyone's going to say, well, that's going to produce a high draw that flies this far. It's binary. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't know that it's Tiger Woods in 2000 on the end of the club or Joe the plumber. Mm -hmm. Shifting impact is our job. That's what makes players yeah. better. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of makes, it seems all very straightforward when you say it like that. Um, <laughs> I think, I think because of. But, but it is know, as well, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it is. But it's, this isn't a, a, a statement that's aimed at, at, at hack motion. I think that we are an incredibly strong position as an industry now because we have got so much technology that gives us so much more fact. But I think we're also at risk of disappearing up our own backsides because we, we, we think the information is the key and we're forgetting that, no, come on, we actually need to make Joe the plumber better now. Mm -hmm. It's coaches are not scientists and scientists are not coaches. Used properly, we can complement one another perfectly for the growth and betterment of the game. Mm -hmm. But I'm not a scientist. If I, if I need to do something clever, I go and refer to my clever mates. I pick up the phone to Mark Bull or I get Mark Bull in front of one of my clients. I use the science to help better my skills, knowledge, information, and understanding. But I'm no scientist. Jeez, I barely went to school. And, and how would you say, kind of from being a hack motion user for a couple of years now, what do you see the kind of, if you look at the, the typical amateur player, club player, where do they have the most benefit of using the technology for their game? I think understanding what they do when they play well. That's mm -hmm. number one. Number two, having some kind of tool. And this is something I, I used, I, I really enjoyed about the, the old 3D systems. We're going back, Christ, 20 years. That audible feedback was a really, really key learning element for people in terms of figuring out what, what correct felt like or what desirable felt like. But that, that, would be, that would be it. Ultimately, this is a tool for coaches to help players get better primarily. Yeah, I think, I think the emphasis on right, the, the feedback that's instantaneous is probably the, the key because you can just Absol absolute, absolutely right and, and adjust. Yeah, practice, practice without feedback is just really shitty exercise. That's, that's a good way to put it. Um, so, so my question would be maybe how do you see, obviously, because the technology is coming in more and more not just in golf and in every sport. Mm. And where do you see kind of that role of the coach being now and how does it evolve over time? Because obviously the, 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 the kind of the, 
the significance of the technology goes up, right? Because there's more information. How do you see the coaches role in that process? Because we have a lot of coaches here joining us today. And obviously they're using different types of tools in their daily practices. So where do you see that coach's role in that dynamic where the technology is coming up, the players get exposed to it. They're probably also demanding it to a certain degree. So where does kind of the whole coach fit in in all of this? Well, uh, where do I want it to go where, versus where I think it might go? <laughs> Let's start with where you think it's going to go or where you want it to go. <laughs> uh, I, it would, it, I'm concerned that we may end up continuing to satiate our desire for knowledge and infor, information, basically stuff. Uh, I'd love it to become a tool that enhances all of our abilities to understand and coach better. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. because we're, as I said, we, we're in this remarkable position that all of this technology should help us all become much, much better at making players better. Yet the average handicap remains the same. Yet people don't take golf lessons because they have this belief that golf lessons make you worse or you have to get worse to get better. Um, Do you think that that exists? That you have to hell yeah. get worse before you get better? Yeah. Hell yeah. Why, why are four and five not going back for a second lesson? That's a good question. That's, Is it too yeah. expensive? I don't think so. Because if, realistically, we're probably a little too cheap for the expertise that a lot of us have. Mm hmm I also essentially Gold. think that the player kind of needs to get worse in their game, and so they have a reason to return to the coach ultimately. Yeah, I, I don't. I mean, that's being. I think that's being very cynical, but yeah, I think it's. I, I, I would like to think that that's not the case, um, I, I, but I am a passionate believer that golf coaches are the single most important people in this game. We retain people, we introduce people, we make the game fun, we create great environments for people, we create we create a great social life for people. That's all down to us as golf coaches. And we probably owe it to the game to do the best possible job we can. And what is your process of developing coaches? Because I don't know, I know you're, that's a big part of your, your everyday life right now. You also mentioned, right, that was the reason kind of you stepped a bit more away from mm -hmm. everyday coaching with the pros kind of. So what is your process for developing young coaches and kind of what's that methodology like? Well, dead simple. I want them all to be to genuinely understand what they coach and why they coach it. I want them to understand who they are as human beings. Uh, I want them to understand what their biases are and how they can potentially be damaging. Uh, I want them to understand exactly what they need to do to get better. But primarily, I want them all to appreciate that how important we are for growing and bettering the game. And it's been it's been an incredible journey so far for the, the two years I've been involved in it. Um, just watching player, watching coaches develop, watching their passion increase, uh, watching their skills increase, and seeing how powerful a community of golf coaches can be in terms of us all getting better. Mm. But it's it's not me saying, right, this is how Humar coaches, so you've all got to do that because Humar is the best. That definitely isn't the case. I'm not even the best in, at my own facility. Um, it's about ensuring that coaches go on their own journey to become best on their terms, which is exactly my journey. My journey was driven 100% by, I, I'm stubborn. I'm a pain in the ass stubborn. I didn't want anyone to give me answers. If I had a, a problem that needing solved, I wanted to go and solve it myself because I felt that that gave me a much better understanding than just being given the answer. And that's, I, I went through, I was bloody minded, as I said, a real stubborn pain in the ass and, and stuck to that and still stick to that. Um, and I, I think that that's one of the reasons that I've become pretty decent at coaching golf, that I've always been trying to understand and get better for the people in front of me, not go and get tons of certificates that tells me that I can answer a multiple choice question on impact. Yeah. And where do you see kind of working with a lot of the young up and coming coaches, where do you see kind of the main areas of improvement for them? Obviously, because you said the passion's there, also like the, the enthusiasm about it, like, but are there any specific areas you see that kind of as an industry, the coaches can get better as a whole? Yes, and, for sure. Right I think. Which would those be? Uh, I don't see enough young coaches. And I must stress that my, all of the programs I run are not specific for young coaches. I genuinely don't care about their background, their education, age, who they're coaching. I just want people that are passionate about coaching golf and getting better. 
but in general, I see very, very shaky knowledge of impact, which bothers me given that's all we're really trying to change. <laughs> um, I see very little regard and understanding of how start position affects impact geometry. And I see very little understanding of why certain movements or, or how movements impact impact geometry. Now, we've got a lot of people coaching pretty golf swings, but they don't have, I've, I've been looking at a couple of players today online and they've, they've had an awful lot of coaching and nothing that they're doing is consistent with the short shape they want to hit. Now, if impact is black and white, that's binary. Start position, there's definitely some preferences that can encourage the right impact and the same with movement. We all have preferences that we believe to be mechanically advantageous. And that there is a system. Mm -hmm. But I think just in terms of coaching golf swing, just a better understanding rather than a raft of knowledge. Hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So, so essentially, it would kind of be, as you said, right, it's just kind of more, not, not more information, but just, yeah, the understanding, I guess, is the right word for it. Kind of understanding the kind of cause effect relationships and how the one affects the other. Yeah. It's, it's kind yeah. of doing that. And you see, uh, how do you think that being resolved, that should be resolved or kind of what's the what's the right method of kind of achieving that right i think one is doing the stuff like you do right which is kind of go teach seminars and then and coaches the show to do it are there other methods you think and other industry participants that are playing a role in this that they should be doing i think our governing bodies can do a better job in ensuring that this is that there's a more robust education You'd like to think that someone came out of someone became qualified really understanding impact. I'd like to think that. Um, I think that as as coaches, we need to have better tools at our disposal, which would be those tools being community, the ability to share ideas, share concerns, ask people why they can't solve this problem. That would help. I think coaches having a, a really robust reflection process would really help. That if you can't shift someone's impact characteristics in three or five balls, you've not given them a good piece of advice. Now, that's not to say that it's going to take five balls to fix someone. I'm categorically not saying that. The actual process of owning the advice that you give them may take months. But actually shifting impact data is pretty freaking easy if you know what you're doing. Um, and uh, I've said this before many times that, and it, it can't be a secret anymore um, from the people I coach, but I, I view every single person I coach as a case study. That this is my opportunity to either validate what I know or question what I know. And if I don't like the answer to the question, that then leads me in, down another road to get better, which, it's pretty cool because you're getting paid to do that as well. It's not a terrible business model. You're getting paid to get better and make people enjoy their favorite hobby more. Yeah, it's not, it's not a bad job to have. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not. It's definitely not. Um, but what, what if we're talking about the, the Joe the Plumber, which is kind of the character of our, of our conversation? Mm -hmm. One thing, obviously, we see our users and, and customers talk about is just the impact that you're mentioning, right? Like having the consistent impact and having a good ball flight coming out of it. Like there'll be kind of a general question and kind of more specifically with hack motion. What do you see are some kind of main improvement areas you've seen how Joe the plumber should think about how to improve his impact consistency and maybe how the hack motion can support that for the player as much as possible in your mind? So I would argue that the majority of Joe the plumbers actually don't understand what the club needs to do to the ball on the ground at impact. So they got no concept or their concept is incorrect. What is, I mean, I'm sure everyone in the room here will agree that the single biggest flaw that we see with club players is low point being too close to the golf ball, no shaft lean, inconsistent striking and face control as a product. We don't have to coach many people outside of those parameters. So number one, is their concept correct? Do they actually understand that the club needs to hit the ball, hit the ground after the ball? Mm -hmm. 
Do they understand that they need to hit the middle of the club? Do they understand that the shaft needs to be leaning more at impact than it is at address? So I would always cover concept. Uh, and then most simple use of, of hack in that instance would be that I would ba basically be able to illustrate to them what their good, what good risk pattern or good risk conditions look like versus bad risk conditions. And then I can set them up to hit tons of shots with audible feedback that tells them whether they've done it or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I think it really kind of all, a lot of times comes down to having quality repetition, and quality training sessions, just to kind of work on. But but I think you, it goes back to what you said. You need to have the the concepts right first, so you're not working on the wrong thing. Completely. So you're not effectively kind of digging a hole in the wrong direction, mm -hmm. uh, but you're actually kind of on a on some sort of plan. And I think that's all probably also where where the coaches come in because it's like it's really a steep task for anyone to kind of figure this out on their own. Mm. Um, because I think uh, yeah, it's just there's a lot of stuff to learn and there's no time and it just you know it's. Whoever kind of yells the loudest is the one that's heard. <laughs> so, yeah, there's there's uh, there is a little bit of that, but it's yeah. Uh, unfortunately, human beings are we're we're conditioned to find the point of the sort of the, the root of least resistance to to some end goal, and in this context, that generally doesn't lead to great understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think evolutionary biology is kind of goes in the route of just finding the path, the easiest path, essentially, how to achieve the goal. So, and and uh, everything that every every piece of technology that exists now is designed to make that path even less resistant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From again, from a coaching perspective, we talked about coaches, but what would be your advice for the players? How could they be better, better players to the coaches and kind of to what, what could they do better in your mind to kind of maximize again their own time and their own investment in the game? Are we talking club players? Yeah. I would take, I'd find someone to help you. And that someone mm -hmm. should have a proven track record for your kind of demographic, how often you play, what your practice habits are. Someone who's proven to get results. Number one. Number two, I would genuinely commit to what they ask you to do. I would far rather they, they had short practice spells more frequently than beat balls for three hours on Saturday morning. Um, I'd encourage them all to keep some kind of stats if their goal is to reduce handicap. That's important that we understand that there's an awful lot of golfers who don't have a handicap and never will. Lots of golfers just want to hit better shots. But also communicating to the coach, this is what I want from golf. Because it's very easy for us coaches to assume that they all want the same thing or they all want to hit better shots and shoot lower scores, where just people want different things. Hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Um, I think it was very insightful. I think one final question I would love to ask you um, from the audience, actually. Uh, does he have an opinion on Homer Kelly's golfing machine book? Um, Freaking love it. <laughs> uh, specifically, the impact fix description. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll tell you why I love it. Because still to this day, it is the only thorough, systematic approach to building a golf swing and subsequently coaching golf. It had, okay, there's a zillion nuances that we can argue about within that book, but holy shit, it's 55 years old. It's the fact that it, it's, it has no opinion of stating what they believe to be fact at the time. That is remarkable. And I think Stack and Tilt does a pretty decent job. The Stack and Tilt, anything Stack and Tilt related does a pretty decent job. But presenting absolutes, or at least, which we, which we would now probably call principles or preferences, but pre presenting in absolute form and presenting it in a very structured, systemized form was revolutionary. And 55 years later, it's still revolutionary. It's not the easiest read in the world. Yeah. Well, well Hugh, I think, well, first of all, I do appreciate you taking the time. I think uh, it was very insightful. I think there's a lot of, lot of stuff that coaches can learn throughout the conversation. 
Uh, and hopefully we, we were able to share some of that with them and then and, uh, they'll take something that to heart and implement their own learning. Uh, but I do appreciate you joining. It was great to have you. And uh, yeah, thanks for sharing the your insights. No, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much.